a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear sisters, dear faithful, within the past 200 years, the Church has given us two great dogmatic definitions concerning the Blessed Virgin Mary. In 1854, Pope Pius IX defined something about Mary's soul, which was her immaculate conception in the womb of her mother, Saint Anne. And in 1950, Pope Pius XII defined something about her body, which was her assumption, which means that at the end of her life, her body was taken up into heaven together with her soul. Despite the recentness of its dogmatic definition, the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary is very likely the oldest of all her feast days celebrated in the sacred liturgy. The text of the Mass, however, for this beautiful feast is relatively new. When Pope Pius XII defined the assumption on November 1st, 1950, at the same time, he introduced a new mass text, one which more clearly stresses the fact of the Assumption in its prayers and readings. But belief in the Assumption dates back to the infancy of the Church. The apostles themselves were witnesses to the fact and preached it to the faithful which is why the fathers of the church have written about it. And so this dogmatic definition of 1950 did not establish a new doctrine or a teaching. What it did was to merely confirm the universal belief of early Christianity, declaring that pre-existing belief to be revealed by God through sacred tradition, which is truly the word of God, just as much as sacred scripture. We must remember that the word of God is twofold. It is written in the Bible and it is spoken by word of mouth through sacred tradition. The assumption, then, was not a new doctrine, but with its dogmatic definition came a new obligation for Christians, the obligation to believe with divine faith, such that failure to believe would constitute heresy, and therefore the loss of divine faith. If anyone deny the truth of Our Lady's bodily assumption into heaven. He is a heretic. One of the most beautiful among the recently appointed texts for today's Mass is the Introit, which is taken from the New Testament book of the Apocalypse. The Apocalypse, of course, is the last book of the Bible. And it is simply a collection of the revelations that God made to St. John the Apostle. St. John, of course, was the youngest and also the purest of the Apostles. And it was his tremendous honor and privilege to take care of the Blessed Virgin after our Lord's ascension into heaven. He was her protector. 
And St. John writes in his Apocalypse, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Literally, these words refer to the church herself. But the church herself, through the writings of her fathers, as also through this new Mass for the Feast of the Assumption, has applied these words to God's Holy Mother. The moon, of course, is always changing. And it's always causing the tides of the Earth's oceans to ebb and to flow, which is to fall and to rise. And thus it is that the oceans are constantly falling and rising because of the gravitational pull of the moon. Applying these words of the Apocalypse To the Blessed Virgin Mary, the fathers of the church explain that the moon signifies the things of this world, which, like the world herself, are uncertain and changeable. And, of course, Our Lady, in the vision of St. John, is trampling the moon underfoot. She is standing upon it. The Immaculate Heart of Mary, we must realize, was never pulled by the things of this world. She never once harbored within her heart a disordered affection for any created thing. The value that she placed on any earthly thing whatsoever corresponded exactly to God's own value of that thing. She placed no more and no less value on any created thing. And the attachments that she had to created things were ordered. They were in perfect harmony with the will of Almighty God. And the only thing which was created that she ever longed after was the sacred humanity which she herself had given to her divine son. That is the only created thing that pulled her soul and her heart. Owing to her immaculate conception, she was entirely free from sin. And so, for her, death was not a penalty for sin. For her, death was something to look forward to. She eagerly awaited her death because she knew that death would unite her once more with her divine son. Each of us will die out of punishment for sin. That is something we cannot avoid. We are bound to follow in the footsteps of our first parent. We share necessarily in the punishment of his sin because his sin has been transmitted to us through human generation. But such was not the case 
with God's holy mother. She died purely out of love for God. Purely out of that tremendous desire to be reunited with her divine son. We, of course, have a completely different attitude toward death. Ours is filled with fear and with dread. We have a completely different attitude toward death precisely because we have a completely different attitude toward life. And so let us take occasion today on this beautiful and hope-inspiring feast to change that, to change our attitude toward life and thereby to change it toward death as well. Let us endeavor to be more mindful of reality as it truly stands. Remembering that reality itself proceeds not from our own fancies, but rather from the order and from the laws which emanate from Almighty God. The ultimate reality is in heaven and in hell. This very moment, those two places are filled with the souls of men which are awaiting their corresponding bodies. In heaven, of course, there is eternal bliss. And in hell, eternal misery. Those two scenarios constitute genuine reality. And in that genuine reality, human life on this earth is but a preparation for death. We are given the span of our lives for the sole purpose of preparing to die well. And the only sure way of dying well is by living well. By living as God himself would have us live. Let us remember that not only were our souls made for heaven, but our bodies also. Let us remember that our lives are as so many precious treasures which must be guarded throughout their entire span. Every thought, every inclination, every word, every action should take place according to the order willed by Almighty God. Otherwise, our lives are a tremendous waste. Of course, our life here below is a tremendous struggle. And throughout that struggle, we are pulled to and fro by God's grace and his holy inspirations on the one hand, and by the allurements of this world on the other. But as we are being pulled to and fro, let us never forget one thing, which is 
that God himself exerts a gravitational pull on each of our souls. That gravitational pull is undeniable. At certain times throughout our lives, it becomes more apparent than at others. At certain times, we are filled with motivation for our own salvation. Holy inspirations and good resolutions swell up within our souls at such times. But all too often, we allow those holy inspirations and motivations to pass without taking advantage of them, without putting them into practice. That gravitational pull on the part of Almighty God will always be there. But the degree to which we are influenced by that pull will depend directly upon our own free will. It will depend upon the choices that we ourselves make day by day. Let us remember also that our blessed Lord has not left us alone in this great struggle. He has given us a very powerful means of sanctifying ourselves, a marvelous gift, the power of which we must never underestimate or take for granted. And that marvelous gift was made possible only through the cooperation of his Holy Mother. She housed protected and nurtured. She tabernacled, if you will, his sacred humanity in her holy womb. And it was through that sacred humanity that he gave us the Holy Eucharist. Our Lord said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. What a tremendous and awe-inspiring gift the Holy Eucharist is. It is the true body of Jesus Christ, the same body that appeared to men, the same body through which our Lord wrought countless miracles upon the sick. It is the true blood of Jesus Christ, the same blood which flowed so profusely from the cross on Mount Calvary for our redemption. And it is the same divinity which is at the source of all God's wondrous works towards men. As we receive the Holy Eucharist, we become more and more like 
God himself. But only if we receive it with the proper dispositions, only if we receive it with love and with purity and with devotion. Let us use the Holy Eucharist to our advantage during our lives so that that spiritual gravitation of God's grace may wrestle us from all disordered attachment to the things of this world, even as it assumed our Blessed Mother into heaven. Where our treasure is, there also will our heart be. Our Blessed Mother's heart was always in heaven with her divine Son, and therefore she died out of love for him. And her body, together with her soul, were pulled into heaven. We ourselves will never be assumed into heaven as Mary was. But we can nevertheless imitate our Blessed Mother in what led to her assumption. By paying very careful attention to the precious pearls of divine wisdom, which fell from our Lord's sacred lips, many of which are contained in the gospel, which is intended by him and by his church to be the pattern of our earthly life. Preach the gospel to every creature, he said to his apostles. Let us drink deep, therefore, of the spirit of the Holy Gospel. And in so doing, let us pay very special attention to the Beatitudes, which we would do well to review from time to time. Let us follow the pattern of the gospel as closely as we are able. In imitation of our Blessed Mother, who is now in heaven, enjoying the vision of God, not only with her mind and with her soul, as the other saints are doing, but also with her bodily eyes, which rest constantly upon the sacred humanity of her divine Son. In fine, let us spend our time living so as to die out of love for Almighty God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.